behind. I pray that, God, that you give them special peace and strength in this day. Lord, I pray for the folks that are here today within the sound of my voice. God, if there's any here that do not know you, Lord, I pray that you'd speak clearly to their heart. And, Lord, that they would understand that they may not have that opportunity to start down the flight of stairs or to kneel in a corner somewhere and to call out to you or to just call out to you before they die. Lord, I, I pray that they'll understand that there's no guarantee that you'll have another opportunity than right now. And so, God, I, I just pray that you would anoint this time, and, Lord, you'd anoint my voice and my memory. And God, you'd use it for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. I bring you greetings from the folks at Shiloh Baptist Church in Newborn, Georgia. Uh, they've been praying for you for the past six weeks. Uh, just as you prayed, they prayed. They prayed that God would uh, send a great revival this week. And I know you're going to hear that song. Uh, I think it may even be tonight, Send a Great Revival in My Soul. And uh, I pray that uh, they, they've joined with us in praying for that. I bring you also greetings from my dear wife. She wanted to be here with me, uh, but her boss had a stroke on Wednesday at work and uh, was suddenly uh, placed in the hospital in intensive care, and now uh, she's still in the hospital at Athens Regional, and her family was obligated or to their families uh, and their church's homecoming today, and so they needed someone to be with her while the family was there preparing the meal in the small church. And so my wife was that someone. And she says she loves you folks. She enjoyed being with y'all a few weeks ago, other than the fact that the preacher that day preached way too long. And she scolded me for that. And uh, she said, uh, you remember that you have a time limit. All right, so it's 1136. Are y'all ready? We're going to do our best. I'm going to try my best to be finished by... Uh, 12 o'clock. As a matter of fact, I normally start off with something humorous, and I'll do that tonight, but I'm not going to do it today. I usually tell some type of true humorous story, but we're, we'll not do that. We'll skip that. We'll get right into the message, and we're going to be preaching a message entitled, uh, That's a Fact, Jack. Over three years ago, probably four or five years ago, a family came across our TV screens. It was a family that was, in many people's eyes, they were strange looking. Long hair, beards, and uh, just rough looking old fellas. And uh, they had a TV show that was called Duck Dynasty. There was uh, many things about that show that reached out to people. Just as quick as they came on the scene, they rose to great popularity, even greater than they had been in the years before on their Duck Commander videos. They rose to great popularity, and just as quick as they rose to great popularity, Satan attacked them. He attacked them mainly because of, even though they looked a lot like uh, the world, they were different than the world. They talk different, and not only did they talk different, but in every TV show they closed out the family sitting at the table praying together. There's one particular character on the show named Uncle Si. Uncle Si is one of my favorite characters on the TV show Duck Dynasty. Uncle Si immediately coined the phrase and made it popular like it had never been before, that's a fact, Jack. And any time Uncle Si said, that's a fact, Jack, he was basically saying this, you can count on it. And today when I preach this message on that's a fact, Jack, it's something that you can count on. Every person sitting here today can count on this happening to you. Every person that walks on this earth can count that this will happen outside of the rapture of the church. I want you to know today that it's a fact that you're going to die. Amen? It's a fact. Uh, some of us may be closer to it than others. None of us know when the time is. Uh, just two weeks ago, my son, who is a captain in the Marine Corps, and his family was struck by death by a dear friend. His friend's little two-year-old boy, who is eight days younger than my grandson, drowned uh, just suddenly. No, no. Uh, I mean, he just disappeared out of his mom's sight and got into a pond and drowned just like that. They were faithful Christians. Death come at an early age. 
back uh, three years ago in our church, we had two boys that uh, had come up in our church ministry, and they had went to college to play baseball. And they were on their way to baseball practice one day when a tree fell and hit the truck that they were in, and instantly both of them were killed, just like that. It's a fact that you're going to die. It does not necessarily, you do not necessarily know when. You think the older you get, the closer you are to death. But dear friend, it does not matter your age. Death is certain to come. Amen. Luke chapter 16 is the text we're from. Jesus tells this story. Now some people refer to it as a parable, but Jesus didn't refer to it as a parable. Nowhere in the parables do you see Jesus actually names names. This is a true story, I believe, and I believe it's a story that tells us about life after death. I love this story simply because of this. It shows me both sides of death. It shows me for those that are believers, and it shows me for those that are not believers what uh, the end result is. So I'll ask you, if you would, stand one more time in the honor of reading of God's Word. And let's start in verse number 19. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores uh, that was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice that. The, the beggar died and was carried to Abraham's bosom or to heaven. But the rich man died, and notice what it says. He was buried. Two different funerals. And, and being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that they may testify to them, lest they also come uh, to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, uh, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but... If one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And I pray the Lord add his rich blessings to the word. You may be seated. Hebrews 9, 27 says, uh, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it is a scientific fact. Or in the words of Uncle Si, it's a fact, Jack, you're going to die. You're going to die, every one of you. It's a fact that we're going to die, as we've already said. And it's a fact that one day that we'll breathe our last breath, the blood will stop going through our veins, and suddenly we will be laying there dead. Many people will be saddened over your death. Millions of people will die this year in the USA. Uh, millions of people will die around the world. Some people that will die this year will be your loved ones. Get this. Some people that will die this year may be sitting right here. We don't know. Few subjects have interested men quite as much as death. Uh, the question was asking Job, if a man dies, shall he live again? The, the real question is this, though. Are you ready are you ready to die? If death come to you today at the age that you're at, are you ready to die? And I, I want to give you five facts that are facts, Jack. There's no way around them. Fact number one, after we die, we will still be alive. 
Do you notice that in our text? Both Lazarus and the rich man experienced life after death. Uh, often this passage is referred to as a parable, as I said, but Jesus actually gives a name. And Jesus said that the rich man had a life of luxury. He was rich and literally he had all the wealth and all these things and still he died. There We passed by a house the other day, my wife and I, and I said, do you remember that home? The story behind that home? She said, I'm not sure. I said, you don't remember the time that we had supper with Danny and Faye back in the mid-90s and that house was being built and what they told us? And she said, oh, yeah. See, the house is a nice three-story brick home over close to Covington, Georgia. It has fine columns out front. It has cast or metal iron gates or whatever out front to decorate it up. It all looks well. Danny told me, uh, he said, Brother Danny, he said, the man that's building that house said he's an atheist, and he told us that he does not believe in God. And he said all the Christians want to talk about their mansion in glory that Jesus talks about, and he said he's building his mansion right here. The other day as we passed through there and as we talked about it, we remembered what happened. Two weeks after Danny Peppers told us this story, that man that was building that house died. He never got into his mansion here on earth. As we passed by the other day, I said, look, they're putting a new roof on it. I thank God that my home in glory won't have to have a new roof. Amen? Uh, it's a perfect place. There's nothing that can deteriorate it because I am a child of God and because Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. Now, Lazarus here in the text is a beggar. The rich man has everything, but Lazarus is a, is a beggar. Let me give you some quick facts about death. Death is a great equalizer. You know that? Death is no respect of persons. Whether you're rich or poor, young or old, black or white, male or female, death comes to all. Not only is death a great equalizer, but death is personal. It affects you. It's something that you can't just talk about that happens to other people, but it's something that is personal and it affects you. Death is certain. Everything that's born must die. I think of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the wise man wrote these words. He said, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. You are going to die. Death often is surprising. Back some years ago, tonight I'll talk about the uh, great extreme makeover and I'll tell you my life story. But back some years ago, my dad, not been long been saved and uh, been generational after generational of alcoholics in our family and uh, all these things. My dad, after he got saved, he wanted to tell people about Jesus and, and uh, he didn't have much education and so he couldn't read or anything, but he wanted to tell people what Jesus had done in him and he thought the best way to do it was to get people to come to church. And so he had just rented the house, the rental property out, and a man named John was there. And the first thing Daddy asked him when he come to look at the house was this, John, do you go to church? And John said, no, I don't. He said, well, John said, uh, I want to invite you to my church. My son's a pastor there and said, uh, I want you to go with me. John said, okay, I'll go. Week one went by and John had an excuse. Two went by, John had an excuse. For about six months, John had an excuse. And then one Friday, my daddy went out on the front porch and was headed out to go somewhere, and John was in his yard, and John said, Mr. Lewis! He said, yeah, what's that? John, he said, uh, it's about 7.30 in the morning. He said, Mr. Lewis, I'm coming to church this Sunday. And daddy said, you are? He said, yeah. He said, do you want to ride with me? He said, sure, I'll ride with you. He said, I'll be there this Sunday. You, you can just let me know what time, and I'll go. Daddy left and went about his way, and John went to work at Hayes Truck and Tractor in Mansfield. John walked into the shop where he worked on tractors, and as he, he walked across the floor, and he picked up a wrench. Suddenly, he fell dead just like that. I mean, just instantly. It's surprising. It might be surprising when your death takes place. 
Some of you may be sitting here today and you may feel like that you're in perfectly good shape and you feel like everything is okay, but you don't know what's going on in your body. Some of you may think that you're the safest driver, but you can't do anything about the nut that might hit you on the road. Amen? When my daughter, who is my oldest child, was uh, 15 years old and she had learner's license, Oh, we would be driving and suddenly something would happen. Somebody would pull out or something and I'd be saying, Whoa, Debbie, whoa, whoa, stop, hold on, hold on. And she says, It would have been their fault, Daddy. I said, Yeah. I said, When we get to heaven, we say, Jesus, we're here, but it was their fault. So it might be surprising when death comes. For those who have been saved, you can claim 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You can be confident in what Paul said in Philippians 1, 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Dear friend, one thing I want you to know is that death is certain. It's a fact that we all will be alive after we die. You see the story of these two? The rich man... It's carried into Abraham's bosom, and he's talking. He's aware of where he's at. I, I, I just sometimes begin to imagine that day. There's a song that the Gaither band sings, and uh, Bill Gaither, I think, might have even wrote it. It says, what a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me, oh listen to this, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Oh what a day, glorious day that will be. Oh, as a child of God, that's a promise to you. It's a promise to you in John 14 where Jesus said this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house and many mansions. So I would have told you, he said, now I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, what a day. As a child of God, that's a great blessing to you. Notice that Lazarus was very aware. But also notice that the rich man was very aware. Fact number two. It's a fact, Jack. As I talk about that, that they were aware that you will be conscious. You'll know things. It's a fact that you're conscious. Apparently, you're conscious of your past because the rich man knows the things that's going on behind him. Lazarus knows the things. After death, we're conscious of our past, but also here's an alarming fact. You're conscious of your present. The rich man, no doubt, knows he's in hell. The rich man, no doubt, is already experiencing the torment of outer darkness that Jesus talked about. The rich man, no doubt, is experiencing the place where Jesus said, The worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The rich man is experiencing horror greater than anything Hollywood has ever produced. He's in great agony. No doubt, old Lazarus, he's experiencing God. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful place. Fact one, after you die, you'll still be alive. Fact two, you'll be conscious. It's the fact, Jack, number three, that after we die, we will be with Christ. Oh, I can't wait. This, just a few weeks ago, I celebrated my 18th year as a pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. I asked for five years when I came there, and, uh, and, and they hadn't run me off yet. It's been 18 years. God has blessed in so many ways. You, I, I can't even begin to say what God has done and give him glory enough of what he's done. And God has put faithful people with me to work with me and to serve me. Listen, I, I tell people that what he's done is he's looked at me and he saw all my uh, small abilities. And he saw all my weakness. And he put someone with me that was strong in the places where my weaknesses were. 
and, and he's give me people. I have right now the best deacon ministry that I've ever had in 30, almost 30 years of pastoring now. It's amazing. These guys are taking care of me and are ministering to the church, and, and it's not about a deacon board where they run everything, but it's about deacons ministering like it was called for in the book of Acts. They're reaching out. They're saying to me, Pastor, you, you don't need to do this. Pastor, you need to let us do this. Let us go take care of this person. Let us take care of you. Pastor, let us help you. It's been an amazing thing what God has put together. And I, all these years... The reason I've been doing what I'm doing is because what he did for me. And the reason I've been doing what I'm doing is because I want other people to see who Jesus is and what he can do in their life. Your topic for revival this week or your uh, title for revival is Extreme Makeover. And tonight I'm going to tell you Extreme Makeover, how not only did the Extreme Makeover take place in my life, but how that it has taken and affected many others around. Extreme Makeover. And the reason I do what I do is because I want to see more people come to Jesus. Fact number three is this. It's a fact. We will be with him when we die if we are his children. Now, I am so eager to see him. I, I can't even begin to imagine. I've studied Revelation. I just finished a series in Daniel uh, back a couple of months ago. And, and then I, I've studied Revelation and I've saw the beauty of heaven and I've saw all the things. But it's more than the streets of gold, the walls of jasper, the gates of pearl. It's more than the fact that there's no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain over there. It's greater than all of that. It's the very fact that I'm going to see the one who gave it all for me. Now, you may think you're worthy of it, but I'm not. I look, and I don't want to say too much, but I look and, uh, at my life and where I'm supposed to be. And I say, God, how could you save such a sinner as me? How could you die for someone like me? Uh, fact number four is this. I said fact one is after we die, we'll still be alive. Fact two, we'll be conscious it's a fact that in fact three that we shall be with Christ. But fact four is this. When we die, all our earthly opportunities are over. All of them are over. It's done. You can have all the good intentions. I, uh, back just a few years ago, a gentleman we witnessed to on many occasions he said, when the time's right, I'll, I'll give my life to Jesus. When he was in his early or late teens, he said, when the time's right, I'll give my life to Jesus. When he turned 21, when the time's right, I'll give my life to Jesus. At 25, he was getting further and further away from God. At 30, he was even further away from God, but he would still say to me when he'd see me, Preacher! When the time's right, you're going to see me sitting on the pew, and I'm going to give my life to Jesus. At 32 years old, leaving the bar room on a motorcycle in our neighborhood, the bar in our neighborhood, out in the country, it's unreal. Leaving the bar room, got on his motorcycle, and he started around the curve, and he didn't make it through the curve. He hit the fence, and he's laid out in the field, and he's laying there with a post, a four-by-four four post driven through his chest. A man and his son rides by and sees him there, and the man tells his son, who is not even old enough to drive, he tells him, son, go to the house. They didn't have a, a pay or cell phone. He said, go to the house and call 911. The man rushes out to the field, and he gets down beside him, and the man is taking his last breaths, laying there with that post in him. And the guy says, hold on, son. He says, hold on. He said, help's on the way. And the man, in his dying words, said this, it's too late. I'm already in hell. And that was his last word. He died. Death is certain. 
He was going to do it. Preacher, I'm going to get right. Soon you'll see me down on the pew. I remember the last time that I talked to him before he died. He said to me, he said these words, Who knows? I might be one of your Sunday school teachers or deacons someday. <laughs> I can hear him with that laugh now. As he mocked God and as he mocked the church. And dear friend, no doubt in my mind, he lifted his eyes in hell. Fact number five and final one. After we die, our destinies are fixed for eternity. I had a, uh, a strange incident to happen a couple of years ago. God, for some reason, has chose to use me at funerals. I mean, I, you wouldn't believe the funerals I've done. I think I think I've just uh, just did 605 the other week, my 605th funeral. And they're not just funerals around here. God has taken me. I had a man call me one time from Mississippi, and he had been in Georgia for a short time, and he had moved back to Mississippi. And he said, Brother Danny, I'm dying. He said, the uh, doctor says I may have about seven days to live. He said, but here's what I need from you. He said, I need you to come to Mississippi and do my funeral. And uh, he says, everything will be taken care of. He says, uh, my secretary is sending you a notice of what motel to go to and everything. He said, they will uh, uh, give you a call when I'm dead and give you the details. He said, I want you to come to my funeral. He said, here's the thing. He said, I want you to preach like you preach on Sunday. He said, I've got kids and I've got grandkids that I've tried to tell. He said, I've got co-workers that I've tried to tell about Jesus. And he says, and they won't listen. He said, you'll have all kinds of people at my funeral. He says, because I have quite an outreach with my job. He said, I want you to come. I want you to preach Jesus. He said, I want you to give an invitation. He said, Brother Danny, will you do it? I said, you know I will. Went to Mississippi. Eight people got saved. Two of them was his grandkids. One of them was his son. And uh, so, and others were other people that he knew through work and all. Did what he wanted to do. Back a couple of years ago, I got a, a call. And a lady that had come to visit her daughter who lived in all places, Reno, Nevada, wanted me to come do her mother's funeral. And uh, so I went to do the funeral. It, it was an amazing thing. Because see, what's in Reno, Nevada is a lot of casinos, but also Reno, Nevada has a large Indian reservation. As a matter of fact, this lady's ashes would be spread on the Reno reservation because, and she would be only the second person white person to ever have their ashes or to be buried on that reservation. It, it was an amazing thing. She had worked with the Peace Corps and had reached out to the reservation people and she had become a part of their family. And even though she was a pale-faced white person, she was able to have her ashes and her ceremony there. During the time there, I met several of the tribesmen. And as I told them about Jesus and as I preached the message for a funeral, there was all types of beliefs. And one guy told me, he said, I believe that we can pray to the spirits of God and can bring a person into his presence after they're dead. Dear friend, there's no place for a person that's not saved other than hell. And Jesus said here in his word, he said, there's no way out of there. There's no way that you can get out of there because there's a great gulf fixed between us and you can't come to heaven and heaven can't come to you. Once death has come, it's over. It's done. The rich man and Lazarus may have known each other on this earth, but now they're eternally separated. It's amazing, Brother Joe. I, I forget how long you've been in the ministry or anything like that, but it, it's amazing. 
at how many people are going to heaven when they die according to family. I mean, people that were some of the most wicked, evil people, but suddenly the wickedness is forgotten by the family, and they start talking about how good they were. Dear friend, goodness won't get you there. You hear me? It won't get you there. I'm afraid that in particular Baptists have done a great injustice to spreading the gospel. And here, here's what it is, and maybe you can associate with this. In the 70s, we came upon a great evangelism effort, evangelistic effort. And when we came across, across this effort, our deal was to get people to call on Jesus to save them. Oh, it was all around that people were coming down the aisles and they were coming to the altars and they were shaking the preacher's hand. And some were even shedding what we called crocodile tears. I was just a teenager then. And they were saying these words, Lord, save me. Because the Word of God does say that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So all they did was say, Lord Jesus, save me. They shook the preacher's hand, they turned around, they walked back. Forget the fact that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit draws first. Forget the fact that when a person is saved, they are born again. And when born again, that word born again, it means a whole new creation. Forget the fact that all of this is supposed to take place with salvation. They said a few words because the preacher told them that was what they were supposed to say. They shook the preacher's hand. They shed some few, a few tears maybe. And then everyone extended the right hand of Christian fellowship. And then they were baptized. They were what? They were baptized. Oh, preacher, <laughs> you mean they were baptized? No, they were baptized. Because, see, listen to this. Unless you're born again, and you go in those waters, you didn't do nothing but take a bath. Unless you have a life-changing experience, unless you have an extreme makeover, you didn't do nothing but be baptized. See, baptism is after a person has accepted Jesus Christ. It is in obedience. It is identifying with him. It's not just a bath. So it's a fact, Jack, that if you're going to heaven, Paul said it this way, today is the day of your salvation. You, you can be in church for all your life. I preach, I, I preach another sermon that I call Baptized. I, and I, I preach that sermon back two years ago at our church. The Holy Spirit was in our midst that day and God was preparing the way for a revival, a harvest revival that was unreal. And that day, when the altar call was given, there was three ladies in my church that was, I'd say, 60 to 70 years old in that range. Two of the three ladies had taught Sunday school. Two of the three ladies were deacons' wives. Two of the three ladies had been in church ever since they were children. But all three of them said this when they came to the altar. Brother Danny, I've been baptized. I said, do what? You say, you were shocked? I, I was shocked. Brother Joe, I, I was like, when God gave me the message, I'm, I'm like, those people never crossed my mind. There's people, look, the, the Bible says, you judge by the fruit that they bear. There's, there's people that I'm, I'm like, mm, he ain't saved. He needs to give his heart to Jesus. There ain't no way a Christian could act that way. But these ladies, no way. You say, well, maybe one of them did it because the other one did it. No, that's what got them there to start with the first time. 
And these three ladies were in different parts of the church. And they all came at the same time. Over the next weeks, and you can look back on my Facebook because we, we videotaped our baptisms. Over the next weeks, we had many come. And he'd always go back to that day in that phrase, Preacher, I've been baptized. Oh, Nita, come down. And she said, Preacher, she says, I've been in church ever since I was a little girl. Mom and Daddy made me go. I said, as an adult, me and Warren, we've been in church. I said, oh, Nita, so Nita. She said, we've been in church all our married life. She said, we've raised our boys in church. She said, but preacher, this past week, I've come to realization that I've never truly asked Jesus to save me. I just was baptized because that was the thing to do. So the next Sunday, we baptized her. During the week, that next week, the phone rings. And it's her husband, Warren. And Warren says, Preacher Danny, it's Warren. I said, yep. He said, uh, you sitting down? I said, no. He said, you might want to. I said, all right. They're probably in their 60s. He said, well, preacher, I, I don't know how to say this, but to just come right out and say it. I got saved a while ago. I said, you did? He said, yep. I said, well, Brother Warren, he's not a deacon in our church, but I knew he was a deacon in another church before they came there. I said, Brother Warren, I thought you was already saved. I thought you was a deacon. He said, I was a lost deacon. I said, you was a lost deacon? He said, yep. He said, if I died, I'd went to hell and said I would have been a deacon in hell. I said, well, my goodness. I said, well, what, what led you to be saved? He said, well, after that message about baptize, baptized or baptized, he said, then after Donita gave her heart to Jesus, he said, I just couldn't rest. And I looked back and I examined. I only did it because I was trying to resolve some issues in my life at that time. And he said, and then I started acting like everyone else and said, trying to be a Christian. He said, but brother... It's the fact that if I died before today, I'd went to hell. Bow your heads and close your eyes. It's a fact, Jack. You're going to die. Here's the question. It's a fact that there's two destinations, heaven and hell, and here's the question. Where's your eternity going to be? Pastors coming to stand down front. They're going to play music. Beloved, listen. Don't take a chance of leaving this place today without Jesus. You hear me? Let me ask you a question. Be honest now. You're not doing this for Pastor Danny, and you're not doing it for Pastor Joe. You're doing it for you. Is anyone here today that would say, really, preacher, I'm not.